So probably the most popular thing that you can do with a laser is engrave, and more than likely you'll start out engraving on wood. In this video, we are going to talk about three different levels of laser engraving. And I wanna give you tips as well as mistakes that I have made in the past so that you can get the best possible laser engrave for you. All right, let's jump into it. So the most basic, but honestly one of the most effective ways to use a laser is with just a solid engrave. In this case, this is a logo, but you might also apply this to text. And a lot of times this is just called a solid vector engrave. Now, while it is simple, you still can make a good bit of mistakes. And the first one has to do with a default setting that your laser might already have on, and that is having the air assist turned on while you are engraving. Now that is definitely a necessity when you're cutting things out. It helps you get cleaner cuts. But when you're engraving, it's actually blowing a lot of the soot and the dust and all of the grime into the engrave, especially if you have your power really high. And I didn't finish this engrave because I was getting a bad example. But you can see I've got a lot of char marks around the edges. And then also with that one, as well. Now turning off the air is one of the ways it's gonna help you avoid that. And it's actually gonna give you a cleaner cut. Because with an engraving, the name of the game is usually speed at lower power. Because a lot of times you're really not trying to get deep into the material. You're really just trying to take off like that top layer and have like a char underneath it, especially if we are talking about wood. And I actually find that if you engrave at a higher power and you start to get more and more depth into to whatever you are engraving. It may give you an effect that you don't actually want. Actually, I had this guy, but it's probably going in like a 16th of an inch. Maybe you can get a profile view of that, which can work. And in this case, it is maple, so you still are getting a contrast once it goes in there. But especially if this is like a cutting board or a surface that someone is going to use, you still are gonna be able to feel those indents in the wood. Where if you're doing less power, but maybe higher speed, you're really not gonna see that effect as much. Now, one thing you can do to give you more definition to your engrave is instead of just doing a fill engrave, you can do an outline of your shape too. And to do this, you're gonna need a vector file, which is why I always recommend doing like logos and text from a vector versus like PNG or a JPEG image because you can't do this really. But this one was done in two passes, so the fill engrave, and then there was an outline around the shape to help give you a little bit more definition between the engrave and the outside of the wood. So if I'm putting these side by side, you get an idea of what to look for. And speaking of wood, the type of wood that you use is gonna give you different effects. I actually find like the medium darkness woods do the best job with engraving. Specifically cherry is one of my favorite things to engrave. Obviously you can get a really nice engraved effect from maple or walnut, but like cherry, cedar, alder, and even like mahogany are gonna give you really nice engraved effects. And I should have said from the top, all of this is basically having to do with engraving wood, but a lot of these tips could apply to different materials. But the next one, you definitely need wood to do it, and that is all about wood grain. And this one I actually did wrong, but the logo is so big that you're not gonna see the effect as much. When you do your engraving, you actually want to do it against the grain. So for this one, it is running up and down. So when it engraves, it's going left to right. So this is what you want to do versus this one, engraving direction is with the grain of the wood. But where it's really going to play into is when you have a more intricate design, especially if it's like a JPEG or bitmap actual image. Try it against the grain if you can, you're gonna wind up getting better results. And speaking of those like photo images, I'm planning on doing a full video about that in the future. If you have questions about it, let me know down in the comments so I'll make sure and address it. Now this is normally where I would have a sponsored segment. I don't have that in this video. Instead, I'm gonna ask you something I basically never asked and that is to like and subscribe. I heard it makes like cool images down below when it's audibly said. So let me know if I've always had a big goal with this channel to actually hit 100,000 and I'm getting sort of ish close, but if you can help me get over that line, I would be eternally grateful and I'll continue to put out hopefully helpful videos for you. Moving right along. So we've got our beginner engrave or really like our really simple engrave, which will be something you wind up doing a lot. Next up is what I am calling your filled engrave, F-I-L-L. -L, meaning you do an engrave that is deep enough that then you can come back and put some type of liquid inside of it. In this case, it is actually black super glue because that's what I had laying around. But in general, the process is similar to this, but you do want to go deeper so you ha actually have an area that the liquid can go into. Because if I 
tried to put epoxy on top of this, there's really not a difference between the top of the material and the bottom of the engrave versus this one, which we had already talked about, um, does have a little bit of a depth to it. Because once you do your engrave, then you're coming back and putting in your tinted liquid. And then you'll sand that back down to hopefully get the really crisp edges. Now, a few tips with this and something I actually didn't do, but the effect of it isn't as big is around some of the edges, you can actually see some bleeding. And that is because after I engraved this, I did not seal the wood. This I highly recommend doing some type of sealant, then coming back and putting in your liquid. The one I actually see working the most and I have the best experience with is using like really long curing epoxy. If you guys have watched any woodworking YouTube videos, uh, Total Boat has probably come up. They have a good one and that's gonna completely seal in the wood to where then you can come back and you're not gonna have any bleeding whatsoever. Also, you're gonna get more bleeding depending on the type of wood that you're using. Walnut, which we're gonna talk a lot more about here in a second, really doesn't have that problem. So that's a good way to go if you don't wanna mess around with this part of it. But a sealant that I probably already have in your shop, especially if you work with wood, is wood glue, especially wood glue that dries clear. That you could do like a wash of your entire material and it's gonna have pretty much the same effect because that is watertight. Now, what I really love about this method is when you're engraving, you're basically talking about making something black. By using a liquid, you can make that liquid any color that you want. A lot of epoxies will actually have pigments that you can put inside of it. So while this one is like black out of the bottle, and so you can buy different powders, they'll give you different effects for the color itself. And because it's multiple colors, you can do multiple colors inside of your engraving. You can have some really cool effects on the engraving side of things. And one thing that I've done a few times, you can use metal powders in there as well. So this is like a dice tower for Dungeons and Dragons. And inside of that Dungeons and Dragons logo is a mixture of super glue and brass powder. So it's hard to catch on camera, but you get that metallic reflection when you're looking at it. And to show another example of the differences between these two levels, and this is just like a straight engrave, just like our level one beginner. And then again, this is our fill engrave. The last thing with this is since you are having to go deeper into the wood, you could do your engraving in multiple passes. So you're not gonna get as much charring and nasty stuff on the edges. You could also mask your wood before, so you could put like painter's tape across it. But then it gets annoying, especially if you have a pretty intricate design, cause you're gonna have to like weed out all of that stuff. Um, what I find is actually the easiest is just to go a little bit deeper than I think I need, fill this back up, and then because the epoxy, whatever like liquid you're using is going to spill over the edges, you're gonna have to sand that back down. So by having more depth, you can sand that surface a little bit deeper where you're not only gonna take out all of the extra super glue or epoxy, but you also take out those burn marks from the top of the wood as well. Last but not least is a method I have never seen before until like a couple of weeks ago. And I gotta give full credit to Trotex YouTube channel. They are a laser manufacturer, but lately they have been putting out some pretty cool videos. And this method is going to be the reverse inlay, which is this right here. And at first glance, this might just look like this is walnut with a white epoxy inside of it. It's not. This is actually walnut with maple inside of it. So this is like wood on wood. This method I have only seen before when people are using CNC's to where you carve out a pocket with your machine. And then you come back and using like a V bit to get the really sharp angles, you can have the reverse image go on top of it, glue it all together and then cut it down the middle. But I never really had seen a laser example to this level before because doing something like this wouldn't be too bad. You could do a deeper engrave on the Star Wars, then you can cut out the lasers using that same image and then glue it together. But to do something like this would be Pretty insane, if not impossible, just because of the amount of little pieces you would have to put inside of it. There are two secrets to this that makes this work. First and foremost is the maple that we are using is not really maple like this. It's a maple veneer, which I actually don't even know if I have any more of. But yeah, something like this. If you haven't used veneers before, they're basically just really thin sheets of wood that are cut out. I mean, I'll include a link below to this specifically, but this is just like a big bag of like random veneers, especially if you can't make them yourself with all kinds of like domestic as well as some pretty cool like exotic woods. This is crazy. I don't know what I'd use this for. Now, because this is so thin, going back to the depth, you don't have to go super deep to do it. The phase one of this that you're seeing right now is the exact same process as this. We're just engraving the image into the wood. Now, the next step is to cut the reverse image of that out of the veneer. And this is where the second element of this process comes in, where Trotec was the first time I've seen someone use this. So this is like aluminum tape, basically. This is a 12 inch roll, and this is an adhesive on the 
the back. Now the key to this is you can take your veneer, attach it to the metal, and again, once that adhesive is off, you've got aluminum on both sides. And since I am using a CO2 laser, diode laser would work as well. When I go to cut the veneer out, that laser beam is not gonna go through the metal. So usually having a laser that can't do anything with metal is a disadvantage. And this way you can use it as an advantage. And this is really cool because at the end, you're gonna have the reverse of this image inside of this wood. And one thing to note with it is I've said cut, but you're really not cutting it out. You're actually like blasting away any of the material that you don't need because if you cut it out, you still would have the excess material. So what you want is the exact inverse of what this is. Then you can take this, your finished veneer, line everything up and glue it together to where you'll get some pretty insane results. Now I've only done this a few times. I can definitely get better with it. I definitely had some failures along the way. And the first failure is probably an obvious one, but not only do you want to inverse your image, meaning whatever is white needs to be black, but you also need to mirror it. I completely forgot to do that. So I tried to do this. And unfortunately with this like Star Wars Aztec design, it's hard to tell that it's not symmetric right off the bat. So I went in there, pushed it together and I was like, oh, this is not working. And that's because I forgot to reverse my image. Now, the second thing is depth. This is important because if you don't get deep enough, not only is it gonna be raised up and you may not have enough material to sand it back down, but it's also gonna be harder to get it to like register into place so everything locks in together. And that is what happened with this one. So this one is mirrored together, but unfortunately, I didn't have it quite lined up that everything isn't fully locking in there. Which brings me to another tip with this. Normally, if you're doing a perfect circle, meaning you're not going to know which way to turn it because you're going to be looking from the back side. It could be helpful to have some registration marks, especially if your material is a little bit bigger. So maybe like a couple circles on the sides so that you know how everything lines up. Now that's really only going to happen if you're doing a circle because if you're doing something like this you can move it around, you can fill everything lock into place because it's a puzzle and it can only lock into place one way or at least like the good puzzles to where finally I had the settings right and I got deep enough into my material to where the inlay worked really well. And to compare this to a simple engrave, it's the same thing in maple, uh, but for me, I would say uh, this one is like way cooler. Now for uh, the bonus tip, and this is going to be specific to Lightburn. So to do something like this, you're gonna have to create the inverse image. A lot of times that was something I had to do in Adobe Illustrator, and the more complex a design, the harder it got. That is not the case with Lightburn. So this is the image that I've got right here, uh, and to see what it looks like, I'm gonna give us a preview. Um, so we can see that the eyes of Darth Vader are white, and his helmet is black. So to do the inverse of that, I'm actually gonna pull this over so you guys can see uh, the difference. All you have to do is put that shape inside of another shape. Uh, so I just grabbed the circle uh, and I drew a circle around it. I wanna make sure it's on the right layer. And then if I go to preview, you can see that we have black eyes, white helmet. So the inverse of that image. And what's helpful too, is it really doesn't matter like what shape you put on it uh, because you're gonna be removing all that material anyway from your veneer. So in this case, this would be the veneer on the left and this would be my solid piece of wood on the right. So yeah, to like inverse the colors of a vector, just put it inside of a bigger vector. All right, I'm gonna do something that they tell you never to do on these tutorial style videos and that is to date it. This is gonna be coming out right before Halloween. So hopefully, you guys have fun and may the force be with you.